interested in the season pass for Who Killed Julie? Want to hear all seven episodes today? Head over to paulsading.com. Click on the shop button at the top of the page and look for the Who Killed Julie download. You get five and a half hours of this story with your purchase and you also help us begin funding the follow-on series to this story. Thank you for your support. Who Killed Julie is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is highly advised. This episode of Who Killed Julie is brought to you by my horror novel, 12 Deaths of Christmas. Available on Amazon for pre-order now. I can't laugh anymore. I can't cry anymore. I can't breathe when he's around. I'm drowning with each and every breath, and it's not a good thing. It hasn't been a good thing. He can't find out, though. God, can you imagine if he did? Julie's Journal, December 29th, 2013. Those are the words of Julie McLemore, straight from her own journal. I'll tell you how I got my hands on it some other time, but... I can't think of a more appropriate way to kick off this series than with that quote. Julie journaled almost daily, starting while she was in college and throughout her adulthood. The quote I just read? That was the last time she journaled. A man she was having an affair with reported her missing the very next day. That was in December of 2013. Her body wasn't found, for almost two years. Mystery and unanswered questions still surround the circumstances of her disappearance and death. Her death was brutal, gruesome, inhumane, a product of rage that can only be born out of raw pain. She was beaten severely, strangled. Her skull was fractured, and her neck was broken, and in the end, her body was unceremoniously dumped in the Gulf Harbor, just north of the city. When I launched this investigation, I was sure the killer was unorganized, sloppy, and vicious. I was only right on one of those attributes. In this series, I'm going to take you through the events surrounding Julie's disappearance and death. This isn't one of those whodunit type stories where you have to parse out who did what with which weapon, nor is it some private eye podcast. No. This is the story about a woman who was broken by the world, the people she loved and who loved her, and the person who hated her enough to kill her. I'll keep it in good taste, but there will be some things I won't be able to avoid, some Details that might not be for all listeners. It's my job. I make no apologies. Consider this a warning that will cover the entire series. Some of you may be disturbed. No, that sounds too draconian, too tacky. What I'm about to share with you in this episode and the ones I'm preparing to release might disturb you. These episodes contain events that are inexplicable, things that don't make sense, things that no human should be able to do to another sentient being, and details of events no one should have to suffer through. If you want to learn what happened to Julie McLemore, I'm going to ask you to understand that or not go any further, because this may be a true story, but it's also a tragedy of the human condition. This is the story of Julie. This is the story of us. I am Emerald Johnson, and this is Who Killed Julie. Homo sapiens are interesting creatures. We can't stand each other, but we can't stand to be separated from each other either. Julie McLemore was like that. 
In that sense, she was just like the rest of us. She went about her life, day in and day out, repeating a routine she secretly hated, but publicly pretended she was grateful for. She was a state employee, state of Washington, in fact, and she hated her job. Only the lucky few wake up excited to make their living each day, but Julie wasn't one of them. Even though she wasn't thrilled with her career, she was still a positive force in the office, the type of person who made others happy, who made the insufferable a little bit more tolerable. I imagine that helped her deal with her demons, with the reality that she, according to her mother, dreamt of a life so different as to be someone else. It was something she would never realize. Not truly, but that's complicated, and we'll get to it. It was a hard life, a difficult reality. Julie served a life sentence as an administrative cog in the machine she dreamt of escaping. Every day, the same. Every minute, torture. Just like so many other aspects of her life. Her torture never stopped. <sighs> I'm on my way to meet with the first person I'd like to introduce you to. The first person I need to introduce you to, a peer of Julie's. A friend, a dear friend. The type of person Julie could depend on when she needed someone to come through for. She had a need for those types of people, but not many who would actually fill the requirements of the position. Julie was, as you will see throughout the series, a, a complex woman. The woman I want to introduce you to is her closest friend, Rachel Leonard. So, you worked with Julie? Yeah, for like, I don't know, five years or something? I've known her for longer practically our entire lives, but yeah, five years sounds about right. In that time, especially the last few years before she disappeared, what did you learn about her? How much of her private life did she share with you? What do you mean? That's a weird question. We were friends. What do you want me to say? I don't want you to say anything. I'm just trying to get your thoughts on all this. What's... What? What's going on? Like I told you on the phone. You shouldn't be prying into this. What? What do you mean? I thought it was pretty clear I didn't want to talk about her, didn't want all these memories drug back up. You shouldn't be doing this. I've been hired to do a job, and I'm going to do it. And I'm hoping you can help me. You agreed to this, after all. I know. It's not like you gave me much of a choice. It's, it's just that... What? What is it? I, I shouldn't be talking to you. I, I don't understand. Why? Says who? Because he, you, this, this investigation. Why are you doing it? A woman went missing and was killed. You don't think I know that? You don't think we all know that? It's all this damn city talked about for ages. What is your endgame? What are you after? Why do I have to be after anything? Because people, people like you, asking questions, you're always after something. Something you shouldn't be. That's how everyone was about her. Only cared about getting their juicy story. Just let this sleeping dog lie. This isn't the way I wanted to start this. Maybe you shouldn't have started it at all. Why, Rachel? Don't you care about what happened to her? Of course I do. Then talk to me. It's not as easy as you think. None of this is. I had no idea what Rachel was talking about then. God, if I had known what I was actually getting into... I might have stopped the investigation, then and there. Some of this shit, it went way beyond a human interest story. Maybe that's how career journalists 
are successful? Maybe that's why I'm nothing more than a glorified blogger. They know when to walk away from a story. I didn't, though. Not back then. <laughs> Sometimes I think I'm so clever. Four years in school and eight years of real world experience. It's supposed to prepare you for investigative work in the real world. I learned very quickly that there are some things humans do that no amount of training can prepare you for. Some things are just inexplicable. I thought I knew. Shit. I thought I knew what I was doing. But this investigation taught me a lot about what I didn't know. Throughout this series of Who Killed Julie, we will be partnering with Safe Place in Olympia, Washington to raise funds for their operations. Safe Place provides crucial services to survivors of domestic and sexual violence. They offer a 24-hour helpline, 24-hour emergency shelter, and sexual assault response, advocacy support groups, legal clinics, children and youth programs, prevention education, community outreach, and training. Please see the donation link in the episode notes. Help us raise as much as we possibly can for Safe Place in Olympia, Washington to serve people who need them now. Today, Olympia, Washington. Tomorrow, your city. Let's change the world. I'm good enough to make a living at this, but... I don't know if I'm cut out for this type of stuff. Not after finishing Julie's story. But that is definitely for another time. Back to this story. Some writers, reporters, bloggers, they can adjust on the fly. I envy them. Rachel had me dead to rights. I was ignorant, and she knew it. What was it she said? Oh, yeah. She called me a pawn. <laughs> That's right. You're nothing but a pawn were her exact words. And not right then, but later, towards the end of our conversation. <laughs> you know, that's not even accurate. What we did, the things she said, then and throughout the course of my investigation... They weren't conversations. They were admissions. Julie wasn't just a state employee. She was a mother, a single mother. You know how the story goes, deadbeat dad, a woman on her own, fighting against the current to try and create a better world for her kids. She did a lot of things society would frown on while commending her spirit to fight. It's a unique privilege to borrow that misconstrued word. The saint and the whore. The Madonna. As a woman, I'll admit, I've got a hard time understanding this sort of thinking, but again, I was raised to question everything. My mother would kick my ass if I didn't. But humor me. If a man stoops to dirty tactics to get what he wants in life, his efforts are lauded, celebrated. He's a go-getter, a shark, a predator. If a woman does it, she's demonized. She's a bitch, sneaky, conniving. Julie was demonized too. In fact, the demonization she felt might have actually contributed to her death, at least in part. I don't know for sure. I don't know if I'll ever know or if anyone else ever will. I, I just hope it's something that I come to understand in time. Her memory, the ghost that lingers, deserves that much at least. Julie directed programs for the state. None of it was sexy, all administrative work. None of it would get the attention of, well, anyone, because no one notices stuff like that. 
As state employees go through their mundane lives, punching the clock, forwarding paperwork, and creating kingdoms their federal brethren would envy, all under the pretenses of doing serious work that serves the people. The people who hurt, the underprivileged, the underserved. Some employees, the ones like Julie, aren't all jaded by their careers, though, not by any measure. Some of them are inspired and inspiring. They worked hard to get that college degree. They had big dreams, dreams that would lead them to those rewards life dangled in front of them to encourage them through the sacrifices obtaining a degree required, only to find that the rewards weren't all they were cracked up to be. They fought and they struggled, looking for the light of the promising, rewarding career and only finding a wall of bureaucracy, tribalism, and uninspired leadership blocking their path. The office Julie worked in was like that, uninspired, morose, an office of zombies, she wrote in her journal. A journal given to me by her father, but I'll talk about that interesting story later. She didn't like most of her coworkers, not through any real fault of her own. She tried, but when you're the new person walking into a toxic environment, it can take an eternity to turn it around, even for someone like Julie. They didn't interact. They didn't share their lives. No Monday morning stories about the fun things they did over the weekend. No bragging about their kids' accomplishments in their last soccer game or details of the wonderful recital. Instead, every day, they came into their open floor cubicle land, plopped down behind the half wall that shielded them from interacting with anyone, and they existed for nine hours until it was time to go home. Day in, day out. Julie struggled with depression. Not just because of her job and her coworkers, but you can't separate those elements from the person. Not entirely. I talked to Rachel about that, too. So there's that. But I'm not sure that's really worth your time. It's definitely not worth mine. Fair enough. Tell me about her depression, then. God, you just dig right in, don't you? I can't imagine you want me leaning on the Olympia news sources, or, God forbid, the sources in Seattle, right? So, work with me. Help me fill in the holes so I can do her memory justice. Help me tell Julie's story the right way. Do you want to help her or not, Rachel? How the fuck is this helping her? Nice. Can I keep that in the record? I'm sorry. Of course I want to help. I, I just don't like this. I don't like all this prying into her business. Julie was an amazing person in. What happened to her is horrible. It's not right, you know? That shit... That happens in movies. It doesn't happen in the state capital. It doesn't happen in Olympia. But it did. <sighs> yeah. It did. You know, she wasn't always like that. Depressed, I mean. There was a time when we were younger. She was a really happy person. Like, silly happy. She wasn't like that before. Before... You can say it. I might be a mess, but I'm not a child. I've dealt with the fact that she was killed. Sort of. Okay. You're saying she wasn't happy, silly happy... Before she disappeared? Why? No, she couldn't be. That place? It sucks the life out of you, I swear. Too many dead souls there. Julie tried, don't get me wrong. When she came on board, she tried to stay positive, tried to freshen the place up and make people happy. Shit. 
She tried to just get those miserable bastards to smile once in a while, and even that was too difficult for most of those cheerless assholes. Parties, birthdays, deaths, newborn babies, didn't matter. Julie was all over that stuff. If something happened in someone's life, she was the first one to get him a cake. Donuts, balloons, a fucking card. She was so tuned in to everyone. It was... She was special. What about the depression, then? You said she wasn't always like that. When did you start seeing signs? Don't you get depressed from time to time? Yes, of course. We all do. Julie was no different, you know? She, she wasn't weird or... or whatever you may be thinking about her. I'm... I'm not trying to say she was. But you keep bringing up these things like she was different. I'm trying to peel away the layers so I can find out what really happened to her. So I can tell her story. That's what I was hired to do. Listen, if this is too much right now, I understand. We can reschedule after a few days or weeks, give you time to think about what you want to say about her, or, or even if you want to keep talking to me about it. But I'm not going to stop until I've finished her story. Yeah? And when will that be? When I've uncovered the real story behind her disappearance and murder. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. Why do you say that? Like, like there's more you're not telling me, more you're not saying. It, it's almost as if you don't want me to know everything. Now stop thinking so much of yourself. What's that supposed to mean? You act like you can understand all this shit. Why Julie did what she did. Why, why she was involved with the people she was involved with. You think you know so much, don't you? Julie was involved in some dark shit and, and powerful people. I'll never understand why. And I tried to talk her out of it, but that woman was headstrong, fucking stubborn. And desperate? What are you talking about? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Rachel played me for stupid at that point. It wasn't surprising, and it wasn't the last time she would either. I learned real quick that dealing with her was always going to be an exercise in my patience. She was a frustrating person. But, as I would discover later, towards the end of the investigation, she had her reasons. All of that to confirm that, yes, Julie did suffer from depression. Routine counseling, medications. She had a history that I'm not even sure Rachel is aware of, though. Julie was good about keeping her secrets secret. Thankfully, her mother wasn't so interested in protecting Julie's darker side from public scrutiny. Make of that what you will. I promise, you'll learn all about her in another episode. But suffice it to say that she missed her daughter. She was still mourning her loss, in fact. And she was willing to do what was needed if it meant finding out what really happened to Julie. At least... That's how things started. They didn't necessarily finish that way. She was an intriguing person. In the next episode, I'll introduce you to Angela Morrison, Julie's mother. Be sure to listen. She had some revealing things to say about her daughter, her daughter's choices, and the men in her daughter's life some of whom she blamed and exonerated in equal measure without evidence to support her justifications. As you'll learn, that's how Angela operated. If you think butting heads with Rachel might have been painful for me, wait until you hear my conversations with Angela. Rachel has nothing on her. You've been listening to Who Killed Julie. I'm Emerald Johnson. Thank you for listening. Keep questioning. Who Killed Julie is written and edited by Paul Sading. 
can find more about me and my books and other audio drama podcasts, my writing podcast, over at paulsading.com. It is produced and sound designed by the excellent Dog and Pony Studios in Las Vegas, Nevada. They are also the company that produced the second season of Subject Found. You can find them at dogandponystudios.net. Emerald Johnson was played by the one and only, the absolutely wonderful and highly talented audiobook narrator, Ashley Litzy. You can find more about Ashley, her work, and her services over at deepcurvesahead.com. Angela Morrison was Robin Siegerman. You can find Robin and her books over at robinsegerman.com. Rachel Leonard is the one and only Rihanna McAfee. You can find her on twitter.com forward slash re McAfee. John McLean of Dog and Pony Studios played Walter McLemore. You can find him at dogandponystudios.net. Christopher Rocco, Olympia based actor, played Caleb Haskins. You can find Caleb's live performances by checking out the schedule at oletheater.com. And Lauren Wisniewski played the customer in episode two. She's a wonderful voice actor who you can find at lawofalltrades.wordpress.com. I want to give a special thanks to Amy Joy Hilt, who beta read for this podcast, volunteered her services, and really helped me tweak it to make sure that it was ready and appropriate for the material. Amy is a teacher in England and sometimes writer, and I want to thank Amy for her help. This show wouldn't have been what it is without her. If you want to find more about my stories, if you want exclusive stories, if you want insights, special posts, live messaging, early and exclusive access, stories that no one else is going to hear, and you really like what I'm doing with Who Killed Julie, you want to see the second part of this series happen, become a patron. Go over to patreon.com forward slash pulsating, pick a reward level that works for your budget, and the exclusives that you want, and help me start funding the next show in this series. You can also find this show, paulsating.com forward slash who dash killed dash Julie, where you can find all of the wonderful actor bios. It's on Libsyn, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play. The show is also on Facebook and Twitter, as am I. You can find me at Paul Sating or at Who Killed Julie. The artwork is done by the wonderful Kessie Rolinicki, who does all of my book covers and podcast covers. And of course, that music that is absolutely perfect for this show was done by none other than John Eric de Guzman of Dog and Pony Studios. Thank you for your download and your listen. Please tell a friend about the show. Please help us spread this important message, this important story, Julie's story, the story of us. Music in these credits is provided by Richard Temple.